Welcome to Hoop HR Highlights Valentine's Day podcast. Today I'm going to be bringing you HR professionals a bit of TLC in the form of Claire Roberts. We've had some great feedback on the podcast so far so if you haven't subscribed already please find us on Spotify or YouTube under Hoop HR Highlights. So Claire Roberts is the Managing Director of HR for HR, which is an independent consultancy. And Claire is hugely passionate about HR and all the individuals who work in the profession. HR can be one of the best professions to work in. HR can be the people that support organizations to grow, develop their people, help shape positive cultures and encourage well-being. But we know that it sometimes comes with its own challenges. And both Claire and myself have something in common in that we, a lot of the time we speak to people when things aren't necessarily smelling of roses. So for us, that can mean people have hit a point where they really want to move on from the job that they're in. Um, And for Claire, it can mean that they really need support, feeling overwhelmed or, you know, just generally emotionally drained. Claire and I spoke a few weeks back and we said we should do this podcast on Valentine's Day to, I suppose, give a bit of love to anyone who's feeling this way. And I think anyone listening may not actually realise that they're in need of listening to what Claire has to say. But I assure you, she has a way of making you think. And I promise you'll resonate in some shape or form. And hopefully you can take a little something from this podcast today. So I'm so excited for this, Claire. Mm -hmm. Do you mind introducing yourself and HR for HR? Of course. So thank you, first of all, for having me on. Um, you're right, we're both so passionate about the HR profession. So it was like yeah. a match made in heaven. Um, so um, my background is um, within HR, you know, 20 odd plus, I'm going to kind of share my age now, but 20 odd <laughs> year um, background in, in HR in some really like complex industries. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason for creating the business, which I launched in um, October 2019, was um, actually after hitting a huge burnout brick wall myself um, Mm. quite dramatically in October 2017. Um, And what I realised through that experience and then, of course, the recovery was that my story was actually far from unique. Um, I felt very alone and I felt like I was the kind of, you know, the only person um, but the more I have shared about my journey, my story, and um, you know, decided to create a business to support HR, mm. the more I found actually other people in HR are, are, are kind of speaking up a bit and saying, yeah. "Oh, yeah, that that's how I feel." And God, yeah, I felt like that a few years ago, and I actually left the job, and I didn't want to. I loved it, and so my my personal story is you know is personal, but in terms of the how you know I it, what built up and what led to that burnout and that finding out that well well who's there for HR who the HR go to um mm. that was the biggest question and the biggest you know personal issue um that took a long time actually to kind of overcome and hence me creating the business that provides HR with the same support and care that we in HR provide to others yes yeah, I remember seeing actually when when you sort of launched it and um, thinking what a fantastic concept because we were, you know, obviously speaking to HR people all the time and the majority of the time when, when we speak to people, it's because they want their, you know, their career move and, and for some reason they're, they're unhappy. And, yeah. you know, the amount of times that we hear um, HR professionals saying that all the things that they're talking about to their own staff is happening to them. Yeah, um, it's it's yeah, it's crazy. So what what would you say kind of the main personal challenges that when you speak to HR that they face? I think that um, some of the biggest areas is is that the the HR is a is an amazing profession, and 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 if you choose that career or if it chooses you sometimes Mm. it's because you have a genuine love and care for other human beings um that you will you know be naturally someone that wants to provide support that wants to add value that you know your your heartstrings get pulled by things and I think what what is really interesting about um the HR profession is of course we're very naturally external facing So what I find with either clients, potential clients, HR departments and teams that I support um, is that, you know, we're very, 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 very good at what we do. So we're very external facing. We're all about the employees, the managers, the business strategy, you know, creating well-being programs. We're very good at being very external and supporting. 
but actually we're not very good at looking inward and looking mm -hmm. after ourselves therefore so having a seat at the table is something that you know hr professionals have talked about there's books about it um and it's something that you know hr has been kind of like knocking on the door of from for many many years in businesses the pandemic thrust HR right at the coal face of those businesses. Now, we in HR know we're already there, um, but sometimes we're not getting that visibility and that um, awareness really from other people. So we've, we can be very, very hard on ourselves. Um, we tend to be people pleasers, we're natural empaths a lot. So there's a lot of personal challenge when it comes to looking at ourselves and we find that we kind of keep going and keep going and keep going and we don't want to give up we don't want to let people down we worry about you know if we say actually guess what I, I just need a bit of a, a rest or a pause or I want a long weekend that we're going to feel like you know someone's going to judge us for not being capable so I think there's um there's lots of complexity I think for the HR profession and, and a lot of it stems from that feeling of you know existing yeah. and then perhaps go into surviving and then actually having this deep desire to to thrive in all aspects of our lives and i think the thing about hr as well is that we are human too mm -hmm. and in businesses um you know even as a you know i'm self-employed and i even i have to do this myself on a daily basis to remember i'm actually an employee of my business i mm -hmm. am a human too yeah. so there's lots of things there that i think that you know can be explored from challenges in um in hr and there's a lot of expectation, isn't it? And you yes, know, you huge are to fix everything, and 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 then that personal expectation as well that you think yeah. Hang on, it's all on my head. But people are so complex, you know. There's so many complexities to the to the workforce, and there's no way that you can just sort of you know wave a magic wand and and fix all of that. Um, one of the things that we hear quite a lot is that companies want to recruit HR professionals to help them drive change. Mm, and that yeah. can be then through culture or it can be through processes and then the HR professional starts the role all excited to sort of yeah. gear up to, to make these changes and then they soon realize that actually their company doesn't want to change um, mm. and you know this is something we hear a lot and, and I think it can be really really soul destroying yeah what what advice would you give to someone in this situation and how can they I suppose maintain their values through that resistance to the change yeah i mean i hear this um so frequently mm. um whether it be with you know clients potential clients people in my network it's, it's a very very kind of common area that comes up um and you're right you know the impact of this on on you as an individual you know you're excited you want to you know you want to really add value um, and make some real positive impact and influence within an organization. And then effectively, it's like a balloon has deflated and all of a sudden, everything that you were super excited about and super ready for has just kind of started eroding very quickly. Oh, so, I think people almost become like shells of their yeah. you know, previous self because of this. And it's, yeah. it's horrible, really. Yeah, is. it is horrible. And I think that the the advice that I would be, that I would give um, particularly through the um, the recruitment process um, is something that you know we all have choices and we all have a responsibility for ourselves like the you know the the, the strap line for HR for HR is everything starts with you yeah. so you in that process you are a stakeholder in that process it's a two-way process mm -hmm. you have to make decisions based on you know what you feel like what energy what's the vibe what's you know what are you feeling during that process and I think that the first thing um is to look at your own personal values we're great in HR at doing you know personality analysis we're looking at the values of the organization we're creating you know mission statements and visions and goals and objectives how often do we actually look at our own which is part yeah. of the reason why everything starts with you right so I would the first thing I would advise people to do if you if you're, you're thinking about changing your role or you're in that process is actually have a look at what your own values are there's loads of tools that are free online you know I can absolutely recommend some actually do that little bit of inner work you know what is what are my values and then use that as a way of choosing and deciding if your next employer is right for you are they aligned are your values are your aspirations are the things that you want to add value to are they aligned and the way you'll know that is by asking questions you know asking well well why why is this wrong? why are you looking to change what hasn't worked so far for you um has someone previously been in that role how successful were they in implementing change 
how, you know, who are the stakeholders um, and how much buy-in have they got? You know, ask some really pointed, honest questions. I think people sometimes, Claire, they, they, they're scared of asking those questions because they get to the interview and they think, gosh, if I start asking all these questions, they're going to think badly of me. Mm. Um, but actually, what have they got to lose? You're totally right. I mean, it's, absolutely it's two-way street. So you're better to find that out then rather than potentially leave a job that you're not that unhappy in for a yeah. progressive role and then find out that actually down the line it's really not it's not the place for you so that's a really good tip yeah and that's self-awareness really I mean that's where you know I start with with all my clients is, is actually start with yourself first you know what are your needs what are your values what are you motivated by um you know how will you build momentum how will you move forward in your career um and you know using your voice use you know be empowered to say you know I want this to be a great experience for us both I don't want you know you don't want your time wasted and your energy wasted and of course you you know you don't want that for that potential new employer so it is very much a two-way process and I'd rather someone ask me questions and have an honest transparent conversation yeah. than finding out from either side several months down the line that oh it's not worked out and you have to start that process again yeah and I think those questions um it's really important to be be probing with those questions as well because you can get like people when they go to an interview sometimes it can be you know a standard generic answer yeah. um, and you can get that back can't you if you ask yeah. a question around something but if you you know and that's where I suppose that self-awareness and that gut instinct comes in where if you sense something it's like probe further oh 100 percent. I call that the tingle. so I call that like follow the tingle so if yeah. you have that little you know that little visceral feeling maybe in your tummy your intuition kind of knocking on you saying god this doesn't feel right trust it really really trust it ask questions and ultimately what sometimes happens is we've we felt so kind of beaten sometimes by our last role that you know we then find what looks like our dream opportunity oh this is amazing you know the company sounds like they're aligned and we're, we're so relieved almost that there's an employer out there that we feel on paper is aligned and then we kind of sometimes almost like go in and we're so excited we're not we're actually not listening you know we almost need to take a pause and a breath and be like okay i'm so excited this sounds amazing i hate the job i'm in or i hate the industry or something's not right or my manager's a pain and we almost get so excited that we just lose track a little bit of what we're there to, to yeah, do really good tip as well um you know because you don't want to jump out of the frying pan into the fire as they say no. isn't it? and um and it's re it's really really easy to do that sometimes yeah and, and, and then you Sorry. can show you can show your passion and your enthusiasm, but also, you know, be realistic. What what is it that you're gonna get out of this? It's okay to be, you know, excited about an opportunity, but then make a different choice then afterwards. And we we hear a lot as well that of HR professionals, they they start a new role um and they've kind of you know they've heard that the company you know is doing great things they've you know almost been sold the dream really mm. and then they they start their role and the first you know first few weeks it's all about getting to know people stakeholder meetings you know mm -hmm. getting to the workforce and then they meet with these people and all they hear is that you know it's negative um yeah you know that everything is bad in this company you know how how do they deal with that then i think there's a there's a couple of areas really with that um i think that sometimes what happens when you join a new role is they you know even in the interview you must hear this all the time mm -hmm. from you know clients and potential clients that say right we're looking for someone that can hit the ground running yes. i hate that phrase right i'm like what yeah. You know basically what you're saying is there's loads of work that hasn't been done and you're looking for someone to come in and, and just get on and do it straight away and you know and i think that um what what happens in those kind of first few months and that managing the expectations and being on the receiving end of course then of perhaps going into a department that's found it extremely difficult particularly over the last couple of years lots of challenge is is to is to look at it from a personal perspective. So again, I'm gonna beat the same drum, everything starts with you. You have no control and you have no idea what other people are thinking, what their experience is like. So if you're coming into a new business or a new team, the only thing that you can be really focused and be responsible for is yourself and how you come across. And I think the key with this is about momentum. 
So what happens is a lot of people start a new role, again, super excited. They want to make a really good impression. And actually, they burn out very, very quickly because they've given everything straight away because they want to impress. They want to move forward. Perhaps they're very aspirational in terms of their um, ambitions. Um, they've got some really tight timescales and projects to work on. So they give absolutely everything of themselves. Now, I'm all for showing up as your whole self i don't separate my business from my personal life if you follow me and know me and you you know you follow me on linkedin you'll know that i share all parts of me i'm a whole human being so the momentum and, and is it sustainable um and the one thing i kind of say to my clients a lot is about just look from a to b because c might never come because something may change so it's one step at a time a to b and this hitting the ground running and the negativity that can be received, you, you have a choice to absorb that or not, as the case may be. And as an empath, being a massive one myself, that's very difficult. So what I you know, do and work with clients is to create their own personalized resilience kind of toolkit. Mm -hmm. So we look at physical, mental, emotional and spiritual care and well-being. So what are making sure those four pillars of your life you know, are almost like, you know, they're not going to become like Teflon because you're human beings. But when there is a knock, when there is someone that's a bit negative and is bringing your energy low, what can you do for yourself? You haven't got to go out and fix the person who's negative or is having their own experience. It's about it's about you. So really, you know, doing that self-awareness work that says, right, OK, I'm not going to be like, like the tortoise and hare. Perfect example. Mm -hmm. Right. You want to be professional. You want to show a great side to you, but you're also a human being with a personal life, yeah. with, with other aspects to you. Um, so really looking at A to B, that's all you're looking at, A to B. And that A to B could be a piece of work, an email, a conversation, a project. It's not about scale and size. It is just about doing one thing um, yeah. and checking that your momentum is actually sustainable. Yeah, because because a lot of employers as well, there'll be there'll be a long term HR strategy of things yes. that you know they're not going to be able to fix within you know within a week, um, and then there's almost like the the more operational stuff that actually you know you could fill a job or yes. you, or you, you know something like that, or you could you know help somebody through um, an ER case or something, give them some advice through that, and I think sometimes um, it's about maybe thinking of those little wins, isn't it, and thinking yeah. right. I'm being judged here and because people do think that don't they they start a job and they, think they don't want to look like they're not they're not capable of doing that role and but they want to meet the expectations the expectations aren't realistic and yeah. sometimes just by doing that one simple thing it mm -hmm. makes people go oh wow you know and, and actually the HR professional may may think that the expectations on them are a lot bigger than they actually are um, and when they do do those little things they don't you know they would feel a lot better about themselves as well I think starting as you mean to go on really and it's a bit of a cliche but I think that you know um, one of the things that, that that I say a lot to my clients um, and when I kind of you know we do feedback and evaluation at the end of the coaching relationship I kind of say what are some of the big things that you take away and and they, a lot of them will say oh well, Claire when you shared you know, actually, no is a full sentence, you know, being able to to make a choice and make a decision when someone wants to pile another piece of work on you when you've just started and all of a sudden you've got all this work that that wasn't, you know, the expectation of is that it actually it's OK to say, you know, no, I, I can't do that piece of work, you know, and also I can I can, you know, absolutely have a look at that. Um, but but what is it on the priority list of work that you've given me that you're happy for me to to move down to the bottom of the list? Or what piece of work are you happy for me to pause in order now to 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 fulfill this new requirement you've got for me? It's absolutely OK to make those choices and yeah. say, you know, no, I, I can't do that extra piece of work. And no, I'm, I'm not available on Friday afternoon. I have booked it off and and not, you know, that this feeling of like guilt almost that you know and I've definitely felt it and I you know I'm a human being and just because I run this business and I support HR I have to look after my mental physical emotional and spiritual well-being every single day I have to I have to be able to say no sometimes to clients I have to be able to say you know no to my son sometimes and actually that I need to put my oxygen mask on first so I think you know setting your stall out you know straight away um, is really, really important so that you're managing those expectations of others, but also your own. Um, yeah. And by, you know, practicing, practice it at home first. 
you know, or with a friend, you know, if you've got a friend that's constantly asking you to, you know, give it, give her a hand with something, then practice and just be like, do you know what? I'd love to be able to help you, but I'm not available until two weeks. I mean, and, it, and it not be apologetic, I, right? I'm listening to you now and I've like drifted off into the thoughts of all the things <laughs> that I need to say no to. I'm, I'm absolutely terrible for it myself, absolutely terrible for it. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? You, you know, you're telling other people, you know, HR professionals constantly telling other people to say no and then they're not yeah. saying no themselves. So yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest things that I find in, it's common denominator in every single one of my clients and people I'm in, in you know, I connect with, you know, regularly um, that were awesome at, you know, at giving support and advice to, um, you know, not just our employees and managers and clients and businesses, but of course, with a go to probably in the family, with a person that, you know, if it's a crisis, you know, our friends come to, we we have that natural ability and energy, which is amazing. But we're, we're really, really not good at, at kind of putting our own oxygen mask on first. And, mm. and I, that is a very common thing. Hence, you know, hence creating the business. Absolutely. And, and sometimes what was crazy is that more that somebody is doing and the harder they're working and the more mm. that they're really achieving, the worse they feel yes. how good they are at their job. Because they're just like, I'm doing, I'm spread too thinly, I'm doing too much, I'm not doing anything well. Yeah. That then can lead to imposter syndrome, um, yeah. which I'm sure we've all felt at some point. Definitely. Um, and it's such a horrible feeling. Um, and, you know, um, and I, I see that with people that go into roles and they're, they're fantastic and they go in, they say, I, I just, I've lost my confidence. I, mm. I, don't, I can't do this. This isn't, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm good anymore. So if you've got any tips of how like the HR community can overcome a feeling of imposter syndrome, if it does happen. Yeah. And I think there's two elements. You've just kind of, you've touched on that there in terms of like losing their, their confidence. And I think that there's, there's two elements. Really. So, so, so initially there's like the imposter syndrome side of it. And that, that, that term gets used a lot. Um, I've certainly, you know, at different times in my life, certainly had that feeling of, you know, I, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't be here. I don't know how on earth I got this job. I remember, you know, in my younger career, um, I used to call myself the blagger oh, I'm just a blagger, I am. You know, and I literally <laughs> used to say it, I li outwardly, that was, oh, I'm just a blagger. Oh, I got this job because I just blagged my way through it. And actually yeah. it was complete rubbish. I got the job because I'm good at what I do. But I just had this sense and this feeling that, you know, I knew I was going to give so much of myself away. I, I know that about me now. I didn't at the time. I've done, you know, done the work. I know that about me now. So I think that with the imposter syndrome, I think you can you can choose to look at it in a different way um and I've got well, you know I, life a lot of life is winging it right you know yeah I mean god like I feel like we're like winging it lots of <laughs> most days in some respects certainly when it comes to you know being a parent as well right I'm like oh my yeah. god my son's just yeah. started high school I feel like I'm winging it all the time but I think you can choose to look at things in in a, in a different way and I think you know this choice around you know we've got a choice constantly about how we look at something the, the language we use how we speak to ourselves all that has an impact on our mindset. And I think with imposter syndrome, I look at it now and I kind of flip it around. And if I have those feelings and like, you know, I'm, 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 we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about the roadshow later, but, you know, there's a little bit of me now like, God, you know, me, me Claire from Cardiff taking out HR for HR on the road. I and mean, there's that, that kind of that feeling of, oh, you know, who do I think I am kind of thing. And then I kind of remember that, you know, I, I don't want to be like everyone else. Imposter syndrome comes from comparing yourself to everybody else. And actually what people want is authenticity. They don't want the same HR person. They don't want the same HR consultants. Like attracts like. And my clients love me and my style because it's my style. It's not because I'm exactly the same as 10 other HR consultants out there. So you can choose to flip this imposter syndrome around and go, actually, I bring unique skills. I've got a, an amazing set of experience that no one else will have got because there's only one you. So I think you can choose to look at imposter syndrome in a different way. And when businesses are saying, oh, we're looking for something really different, they don't want to hear a bog standard answer. Well, that's because they've had that. Give them the answer that is authentic to you, which is like, this is what I want to do. I want to radicalize this. You know, I have no problem saying now because I've got to that position that I want to absolutely positively impact the whole HR profession, not just in the UK. And I'm very happy to say that. Does it make my, toe, my toes crunch a little bit? Well, yeah, of course it is, because it actually means something to me. I'm passionate about it. 
Um, and therefore, that's where imposter syndrome can come from. It's not always a negative thing. It actually means you really, really care because yeah. if you, you, you wouldn't have it if you really didn't. No, no, you're right. it. So I think that's a bit around the imposter syndrome. And then I think in terms of confidence, which absolutely can be linked, I think that what I found and this week alone with two of my clients is on one of the tools that I use with them. They've they each put and they don't they don't know each other. They each put confidence as an area they want to work on. Mm. And when I started drilling down into, well, give me some examples. Like, what what does that look like? And, you know, we start, I started asking some questions. It transpired that it wasn't actually confidence as such it wasn't that they were not confident it was that they'd had an experience and that they hadn't spoken up about it well, okay that you know that's actually about choosing to communicate in a different way um that you know, so so we say confidence a lot but actually you know when we're looking at things like burnout yes it can absolutely it, it had a massive impact on my confidence but actually when i looked at it and broke it down into being a smaller thing than confidence, which feels overwhelming and like, well, I'm not confident, I can't do anything. It's not true. It's, it's, it's yeah. literally making up a story of, effectively. Yeah. You're really making it up because actually the fact that you went into a meeting or, or you're, the MD of the business asked you to do something and you said, um, no, I, I, I can't do that this week, but I can you know, move some things around and do it next week. That's showing confidence, that's showing assertiveness, that's showing resilience. So what is it that's genuinely not working for you right now what is it that feels mm, that's something not quite right many many times it is not confidence it is something else and, and that's the the self-awareness piece you mentioned burnout there as well and then um, i suppose you know people often don't realize they're burnt out until it's too late and they're really yeah. burnt out. Um, yeah. you know what what are the signs of burnout that hr professionals or i suppose anyone really needs to look out for in themselves I think that, you know, the World Health Organization has done some great work around, you know, burnout since 2019. And, you know, and, and there's definitely what they describe the three characteristics as being um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree at all. Um, however, you know, the World Health Organization talks about burnout as being a work um, work related stress that's been unsuccessfully managed. And when I think about my personal burnout experience, I'd actually created living on the cliff edge of burnout as my normal. That was my normal way of life. So nobody yeah. was really noticing, um, including myself, because I had I had allowed and I had made poor choices. And I, you know, I just allowed those feelings physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually to erode and deplete over time. And that became my normal. And I compare it um, and some people kind of don't necessarily like this comparison but this is who I am and I'm authentic I almost compare it to going you know and you kind of say things like about being um uh, nose blind so you kind of go into someone's house and you go my god they bloody stinks a dog and they go oh does my house smell nice and fresh and you think god no it doesn't they've become <laughs> so so if they, it's become so normal for them to smell that that they just don't notice it um, and I think that's one of the, the biggest risks is that, you know, I think people think that burnout is something that is bang, happens, boom, um, you know, it's an overnight thing. Um, and actually, I think a lot, particularly for HR, um, particularly for HR, because of the natural way that we are, that it actually, you know, for me was it was years on reflection. It had been creeping up for years. I ignored the signs. Um, I ignored things that were going on in my personal life as well as my professional life because, you know, I'm a whole human being. So, like I say, I don't disagree with what the World Health Organization, organization says and employers absolutely have some, some responsibility, but so does the human being themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and there was, you know, if I, if I explained what was going on in my life the year before the actual burnout, most people go, well, gosh, Claire, I'm, I'm not surprised, both personally and professionally. Um, thing, because if, if, you know, if the person doesn't realise it themselves and they're masking it very well, yeah. the employer, it, you know, the employer can't always tell at all either. You know, they might think, oh, this person's fine. Yeah, I mean, I remember being judged massively, you know, hugely being judged for like, well, Claire, you know, she's a mental health first aider. 
you know, what the, she can't have something, you know, that's not quite right with her mental health. Was something else that you were, you were adding yeah. to your portfolio yeah. and saying yes to there, see, Claire. Bring it on, <laughs> bring it on. Of course, you know, I'm only, you know, sinking in like a zombie of a woman here. Um, so I think there's that, there's the, 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 the signs that you are ignoring for me, uh, you know, are the alarm bells. What are your electric fences? Where, you know, if you've not created any boundaries or non-negotiables in your life, particularly from a HR perspective, you are going to be susceptible to burnout because you you are not necessarily thinking about yourself because you know we believe our role is to be thinking about everybody else. But there's an integrity piece that I re realized through my recovery is that how on earth could I be the best person possible to support the employees, the managers, the clients, my son, my friends, you know, my ex-husband back then, <laughs> um, you know, how on earth could I be in the best position possible to provide this service that gave yeah. me fulfillment and joy in my life if actually I was at the very end of my tether physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually? I'm like, I, had to, I questioned my own integrity, which is, which, you know, my integrity means so much to me. Yeah. And I kind of would ask if anyone's listening to this from a HR perspective is, you know, if you're going out there putting out, you know, amazing strategies for well-being and mental health and you know we've got international women's day coming up in march and and you're putting all these things together what what about what about yours if you're going home and you're upset you're, you and you don't know why if you're not sleeping right if you know your weight is fluctuating if your periods are off if you find yourself being quite extreme in terms of um your mood your energy levels if you're literally you know on monday morning you, 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 the thought of getting to Friday makes you know makes you literally want to just not get in your car and drive to the office. The, all of these things um, are signs that you know that you need some support. And doesn't mean we're weak. Doesn't mean we're not capable. Doesn't mean that we can't do our job. It purely means we're human beings and we have mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health like anybody else. So you mentioned there some of the sort of key signs of, of burnout that people may li be listening to this and thinking, God, that's me. You know, yeah. I, I feel like that. And I, I didn't realise um, what if, if you suddenly think, right, actually, yet yeah, I am burnt out. I am. I need to change. How do you then manage that to, you know, what sometimes I'm easier said than done, doesn't it? But how, how do you then like change that? Yeah, I think that um, the first thing that you have to do is is like accept and recognize that, that that's where you're at. Um, and, you know, everything, as I say, you know, I'll keep banging that drum. Everything starts with you. So it is about creating a pause um, and realizing what are the implications if you do nothing? You know, what are the implications on your health, on your relationships, on your career? You know, if you don't do something to stop these feelings these behaviors these actions like where is this runaway train going to end up so um the first thing that i do is you know is say to, to clients about pressing pause and sometimes that's a pause on you know turning your phone off turning your email off pressing pause in you know if there is something that you can press pause on in your life then press pause on it um, and my press pause, you know, I, I couldn't press pause on being a mum. I couldn't press pause on, you know, at the time, you know, being a wife. I couldn't press pause on, you know, running my home. But I was able to press pause on work temporarily. And I was actually that physically, mentally and emotionally unwell that, you know, there's a point where your body will 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 stop you. You won't have a choice. And that's like, you know, like burnout brick wall, as I call it, where you don't have a choice. You actually cannot function. So um, the, the the thing that that, that 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 I always suggest is that you actually press pause and you have no choice but to make time for yourself. And that means saying no. That means, you know, when people ask you to make plans, you say, you know, thanks for asking, but it's a no this time. That's a perfect example of saying actually and you haven't got to say it be apologetic and justify you can just be like you know no i'm gonna i'm gonna have a weekend to myself this weekend um asking for help is one of the most excruciating things personally and i i battle with this still years on um it's not my natural way but i've i've learned the hard way that asking for help asking for support you know if you have got partners and friends and families and your boss and your team and your colleagues 
you know, actually learning to create those boundaries and delegating and taking away that control. Um, all those things will, will help, help kind of manage that. I've created, you know, an actual, um, what I call the reset roadmap is like seven R's um, mm -hmm. about like, so once you've kind of have injected that pause, um, then, you know, have a looking at, um, you know, the recovery and the recharge, you know, what is it? And, and ultimately kind of relaunching. So that feeling of going from existing, surviving to thriving and being able to kind of bounce in between really the kind of surviving and thriving if you're thriving all the time 24 7 you know seven days a week 12 months of the year that isn't realistic either so we have this expectation of oh we need to go from feeling like I call myself like the zombie or the husk because that's how I felt to be in this awesome jazz hands full-on amazing human being every day is that how I feel no because it's not realistic so creating some tools um and working out what works for you for some people it's fitness for some people it's sleep for some people it's um you know conversations for some people it's reading there, there, there are so many different ways you know i'm in the middle of writing a book and one of the chapters is called how reiki changed my life um i was one of these people that was like full of judgment like, what, what what's all this rubbish oh hey reiki oh, it's all woo woo and all that kind of stuff but guess what you know actually becoming curious is one of the biggest ways of just being open-minded and thinking what's the worst that's going to happen I'm going to go to Reiki and I'm not going to like it okay but actually I could go there and it could be an amazing experience and be something that I put in my toolkit to top my mental physical emotional spiritual resilience levels up so creating your own personalized toolkit but you know first and foremost there's a recovery process and, and asking for help and being authentic and saying, I need to make some change and taking action is the biggest thing that someone can do. Wow, honestly, I'm just listening, just thinking, it's, you just hear it so often, don't you, with people. Um, and it's, it's nice sometimes to, to know these things. So I think you can recognize the signs of maybe your colleagues or yeah. your team or your friends, your family. And actually you think, do you know what I've just thought they've been really grumpy or yeah I mean I, I I definitely have experienced in my in my life um like I describe myself now as as having having lived a very inauthentic life um I now live in true authenticity and I trust in my yeah. authentic knowing because yeah. it's actually it's actually more exhausting and added to my burnout being so inauthentic. So being a fake, pretending, you know, and I use the hashtag fine, not fine, very, you know, very often. People ask you, oh, how, how are you doing? How's your weekend? Yeah, fine, fine. Because but uh, because the truth is, you know, if 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 someone asks me back then how 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 I was, how I was feeling, just in just general chit chat, not even in a sit down, I'm concerned about you, Claire. Can we have a conversation? I was afraid that I would burst into tears. I was, yeah. I had to lie effectively and be like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's exhausting, you and, know. And that mask, that mask that I wore, you know, and I used to say that, you know, and I talk about the dress code of HR a lot. And I, I used, you know, nice suits and, you know, stiletto heels as my scaffolding. That's literally what was keeping me up on a daily basis. You won't catch me, you know, necessarily wearing that now because that's my choice. I don't, I don't want to and I don't need to. I don't need that as a scaffolding. I've chosen and I've created a resilience toolkit now that I dip into constantly, even if I if I don't even notice I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And I think it's just important as well, just listening to what you're saying, that sometimes, you know, you can have, a, I don't know, a drink date arranged with one of your friends and last minute they say, no, I can't come. Yeah. And, and you know, on the other side, you're, oh, they've let me down. But actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Actually, they yeah. could be going through burnout and they could be doing exactly what you're saying and going, do you know what? This has been difficult. I, I really do want to go for this drink, but I have to say no. Yeah. So it's about recognizing, I suppose, the signs in others around us as well that's, that this is helpful for. Yeah. And also perhaps offering an alternative, because sometimes it's not necessarily that they, you know, that you don't want to see somebody. It's maybe sometimes that the thought of, you know, getting dolled up and going into, you know, Cardiff City Centre on a Friday night after work, it just feels exhausting. But oh, perhaps, me, but perhaps oh, me too, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm 45 in a couple of weeks, I thought it was my age, but it's not, it's just that I just don't want to do that anymore. No, um, no. But actually, you know, why not suggest something else? Why not suggest going to the cinema? Why not suggest going for yeah. a walk? 
why not suggest, you know, why don't you just come around with you have a takeaway and, and let's sit in our pyjamas and have a cup of tea. You know, it does, you know, actually offer an alternative. Don't make it so personal. So if someone cancels on you or if someone doesn't reply to a text message or, you know, you've still got those ticks that are not blue, we've all done it. We've all, yeah. you know, we've all done it. We've all made that judgment and all made that thought, well, where's that person come back to me? And God, they're usually really good and, and we take it personally. So I'm taking it personally, ask the question. God, that's yeah. unusual that you haven't replied. Is everything all right? Do you fancy a chat? You know, why not go that route instead of making it that it's something bad and something wrong? Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we have no idea what is going on in someone else's life. None. We think even our closest friends, actually, there are stuff going on. There are thoughts that those people are having. We have no clue about. So, you know, let's be compassionate with ourselves first, but with other people as well. It's true. Very true. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Emily, actually, like, what, what do you find from a HR perspective when, when you're to, talking to your um candidates when you're talking to other hr professionals in your network and they perhaps come to you to look for a new job Do, are you finding that people are specifically saying that they're looking for a new job because they feel burnt out we do hear that and i, I think i'd say aside from redundancy or relocation um the kind of two most common reasons that a hr professional would come to us looking for work would be their desire for progression because they may have hit a glass ceiling and they, they really want something something more um or that they're unhappy in the role and then yeah. if they're unhappy in that role it's down to really often unrealistic expectations so they've gone in they've been expected to do something and they feel burnt out and then exactly as we've talked about they get that imposter syndrome mm. lose their confidence feel that they they can't do it um another reason may be that the company that they're working for and um, there's that there's that adversity to change yeah and they're not able to implement what they wanted to and then that kind of leads to a misalignment of their values and they feel you know oh this isn't what i thought it was i don't feel right doing this um and i think like you know i know, I know we've talked about this before but so many people then think that they're stuck and yes. that is literally it yeah and I think, you know there's there's lots of reasons behind that as well you know it can be a pride thing they think oh hang on a minute i've you know i i, I committed to this i don't want to look like i've failed or um they want to achieve something and then they feel like it's unfinished they oh, i can't go until you know until i've done that yeah um and and another thing which is a really interesting thing that i hear a lot is well, I've got to stay for the year because mm. I don't want to have too many jobs on my CV. I don't want to look like I've job hopped. And yes. it's so horrible to hear that because I think no job is worth sacrificing your health, your well-being. Um, and it's and often it's not them that's failed. It's it's the job or the company that's failed them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's how we look at it. And, and a friend of mine, I sent I sent something to her recently because I saw um, uh, something that Stephen Bartlett posted on on LinkedIn. But she was in a position, and she said, "Look, I'm really unhappy here, but I I I'm just so sort of scared to leave." And, and in the end, she bit the bullet and handed a notice in with nothing to go to. And I said, "Look," and it was this like, something flagged up on my LinkedIn, and it said, "Contrary to popular opinion, quitting is for winners. Mm. Knowing when to quit, change direction, leave a toxic situation, demand for from more from life." Life, give up on something that wasn't working and move on is a very important skill that people who win at life always seem to have and I thought absolutely oh god it's so true and like you know I, I see people that come to us and they say oh I you know I've done this for six months it's not right for me and I want to move on and I think how brave like yeah. literally and then they move to something else and then you see them thriving and they moving up the ranks and they're, they're they're really enjoying life they're doing great things and i think you know at hoop we've got um a new sort of marketing caption which is new job now yeah and i thought it was really clever because i think there's this whole thing new year new job you know when yep. you hear actually when you know i'm going to get a job now after after christmas or mm. I'm, I'm thinking once i've been there three years i'll get a new job why you know and this new job now is quite it's, it's quite aligned to the well-being side um and it's sort of thinking actually why not if you're not happy now if you're burnt out now leave now <laughs> you know yeah um, absolutely it, and and you know if people that are listening to this are thinking god like you know i i've only been here six months in the last place so you know didn't work out as much yes you are going to find some some employers that will look at that and they judge it that you are you know i'm not going to deny that that does happen but then also there are so many people that won't um and there's always a story i think 
behind yeah. um, behind the reason that somebody's leaving that role and you know when you've got to tell it in a professional way um but you you know you should tell that story um and 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 be proud of that and and I think HR a lot of people do move after two years it's quite common because some of the most um successful HR professionals are those that have worked in a, a lot of different companies and they've seen different things they've worked with different demographics they've worked with diverse workforces so they're best place to give advice on people um so that's okay okay too um you know it's 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 but in answer to your question it's absolutely it's something it's a it's a huge reason that that people leave and it's sad to see sometimes but I think like talking about you know all the negative here today is about giving back um and it's about um how can we give some tips and you know you use your really really sound advice and knowledge have you got like what would your top tips to hr professionals be i suppose that are really battling with making changes that are being resisted and you know they're struggling with the things that we've talked about today yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that one of the the key things is recognizing when it, it is you're ready and and the, and it's the right time. Um, I think that you know you just described there around resilience, and I think some of the some of the times in my life where I've actually shown the most resilience is when I've made a decision and said, okay, this needs to stop. So we talk about um, you know, oh, you know, it's 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 giving up you know, you shouldn't quit, it's giving up, you know, you haven't tried hard enough. And that means you're not resilient. Um, and I think, well, actually, you know, we don't say that when someone leaves a toxic relationship, and that can be with your employer. Um, you don't kind of say, oh, well, you know, um, well, you should have stayed with them. Well, Gosh, well, no, it's the, mo it's the most resilient I've ever shown in my life, you know, so so I think there's, there's, again, it's very much around mindset and the way you're thinking. Um, so some of the kind of top tips, um, I've got a, I've got a juicy one, actually. That um, So if you're in a position where you have made that choice and you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm actually ready and I may have only worked for this business for three months. I may have literally just passed my probation and realized, actually, this is not for me. And you're feeling that, you know, well, I, I just want to. You know, life's too short and it really, really is. None of us have any idea how long we're going to be here for. Um, I think that one of the tips I would suggest is, and it could be good for you guys from a, from a, you know, with your client's perspective, actually, Emily, is that yeah. if you're in a position where, you know, you're really attracted to a role, or you've gone through the interview process and, you know, perhaps there's a salary negotiation and, you know, we all know what it's like, you know, cost of living, prices increasing, you know, the fuel bills, all this kind of stuff. It's hard actually for businesses to be able to say, well, you know, the market rate for that role is X, but you want Y, you know, how, how are we, how are we going to manage that? There's actually, what else motivates you? Um, yes, money is an essential ingredient. Of course it is in all our lives, but perhaps as part of that negotiation, you ask for coaching that, you know, that you ask for an investment in you um, and belief in you and for them to nurture, for them to, um, support you as a HR professional and not because there's something wrong or something needs fixing or because you're close to burnout but because actually you know HR need people to be there when they need somebody and to help them support and to help them thrive and to help them grow and develop personally so I think that you know it's something I've advised a few people with recently yeah, but when you're in that when you're in that position and they go well we can't offer you more salary because of course you know more salary means you're going to pay more tax you know it means you know there's there's, there's added you know costs to you know giving somebody uh, you know an increased salary but something like coaching or you know something like you know workshops or you know having some support for you as a as a hr professional and a hr part of a hr team um it could be group coaching for your department you know ask for these things the worst that they can say is no but they might say yes, and in which case you're going to get a huge amount of value. And it, it, it can have a, the byproduct of it is that you have an increased sense of value that you have been genuinely seen by that MD of the business or by the HR director who's interviewing you. And I think that's a, that's a huge tip, I think, for, for, for HR professionals. Um, and I think, like I say, I've said already, you know, realizing that you want to make change and, and, and taking some action. Um, remembering that you are human and also that you are an employee too so this is something that you know a lot of people in HR forget they forget they're actually an employee as well in that business 
Yeah. And that all the policies, all the processes, all the support that you give out to, you know, your your teams and your employees and managers is absolutely available to you as well. Um, and that you're no different, um, you know, and I've and I've experienced this myself, you know, in my career that, oh, well, you're not the same. You're in HR. You're not the same as other employees. Yes, we are. We are human beings. We have a life. We have a physical, mental, emotional and spiritual health. And actually, you know, being authentic, looking inwards and starting on a journey that is going to be seriously fulfilling um, will have a huge impact on your life and others. It will have a ripple effect on everybody around you. Oh, honestly, that's really, really good tips. So I, I really, I could talk to you all day, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I could so talk for whales, nice. as you know. <laughs> I know, but honestly, there's so, so much brilliant stuff. And I really hope that anyone that's been listening to this today um, from HR, we, we decided to put this out on Valentine's Day because we thought, you know what? It's all about us. It's all about you. It's all about actually this community and giving a bit, bit of love. I know it sounds cheesy on Valentine's Day, but um, I know you've got a roadshow coming up as well that you mentioned earlier yeah and um it sounds so exciting um so what's what's all that about it's on is it the 8th of march it is so it's on the 8th of march which is also international women's day that wasn't deliberate actually um but uh, it, it, it coincides beautifully with that it does. um and there's a lot of women in hr not to say there's not men of course but there are a lot of women in in hr yeah. um so it is being held in the village hotel in cardiff on the 8th um, and all the details can be found on my website um what to expect or what maybe what not to expect on the road show is you've probably gathered you know by maybe how i hope how i've come across today very authentic very real what you see is what you get i'm down to earth you know i'm borderline and professional i'm going to say at times um and i live a tr my true authentic life so don't expect you know a seminar death by powerpoint um you know don't expect a sales pitch there's no call to action there's no well if you come you'll get discount off my next coaching program i mean if you want it always ask right but um that's not the point of the roadshow um the point of the roadshow is to um get personalized transformational results from attending so you'll be with other amazing hr people so it would be a great opportunity to you know, to have lush conversations. So I'm not even going to use the N, the networking word, because it's not about that per se, but you will naturally have some fabulous connections, I'm sure. Um, but I've kind of, <laughs> I've kind of, so I'm selling it almost like as Nessa from Gavin and Stacey meets Tony Robbins, because you'll have the down to earth Cardiff Claire, but you'll also get, you know, high energy, you'll get personalized results. It's effectively like a big um like a bit of a group coaching really um there will be a few little powerpoint slides but you're going to get loads of tools tips um and you'll get a goodie bag you'll get all your refreshments provided parking wi-fi lunch and just lots of hr love um wow. so yeah don't expect seminar and dry content and employment law updates and anything actually to do with practical hr that's not what it's about it's actually all about you as a hr human being well, that's it. And I suppose, it's, you know, you said quite a few times, it all starts with you. And if anyone who sort of thinks, actually, I need some time for myself, maybe going along to that is something that's a step into thinking yeah. about you because it's going to give you all of those tools. So A, a to B, Emily, A to B. A this to could B. be your first A to B, book a ticket. Oh, <laughs> well, honestly, as I said, it's been so insightful. And, and if anyone does want to see Claire in action, um, the roadshow, as she said, is in the Cardiff Village Hotel. It's the Chorus in Ramsbach one um, on the 8th of March, which is also coincides with International Women's Day. There is a bar there as well. So I'm sure anyone can get, you know, a nice, a nice glass of wine if they fancy that as a celebration of themselves. Um, and you can book your place on Claire's website, which is um, www.hr4hr.co.uk and the four is F-O-R. So we've um, really enjoyed today and um, thank you so much, Claire. Thank you for having me. It's been amazing. No I've loved it. We've had some really good feedback on our um, on our channel, on our podcast so far. So if you are listening today and you'd like to hear more HR highlights from us at Hoop, please do subscribe to our channel. Um, it's on Spotify and it's Hoop HR Highlights. But thank you everyone for listening.